Oh, good evening, East Texas. How y'all doing out there? It's good to be with you this evening. So we're going to be used to speaking in front of the audience. So if this works or not, don't work in the bathroom. Hear me whatever. Thank you again, Rick Green, for such a great presentation, such inspiration. So Rick Green brought your heart into this, gave you the inspiration. I'm going to take you to school. We're going to learn something tonight. You know, it's such an honor to speak to a group of folks, especially in the great state of forget too. I want to thank Mark Covey and his wonderful family for putting this event together. The committee chairs, all the people that were a part of this and their faith in the work that we do. Couldn't do it without local patriots like Mark and David and their family and team. So thank you for the hospitality and for the courage to put an event like this together. For a lot of people these days, it does take courage to put an event like this together and find out if people still believe in what we've always believed in. I want to talk to you about Texas values. And I'm not talking about the logo, the banner, the name of the organization I lead. I want to talk to you about faith, family, and freedom. Because when you think about the two words, Texas values, that's what you think about. Texas values have always been faith, family, and freedom. You go back to the Alamo and look at some of the letters that Travis wrote when he was under siege. One of the only ones left in the Alamo, and he was writing about these principles. So when you think about faith, family, and freedom, those have always been Texas values. But what we're seeing is this trend lately that want us to be afraid to talk about these values. They want us to be ashamed. They say, want us to be ashamed to call ourselves Texans. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I'm... And I will always be a proud to call myself a Texan. But, you know, you heard a little bit about my background, the work we do, some of the issues we've been involved in. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but we're going to drill down on some action steps before I finish my remarks. But, look, maybe you and I haven't met before. You know, maybe you're not a part of that following on our Facebook page when we do Facebook Live and all those other fun stuff we like to do to engage you. You haven't heard the weekly radio show. You probably haven't. That's fine. I want to tell you a little bit about myself, though, because I firmly believe before I can encourage you, suggest, and dare I say demand that you do something moving forward after this event, I want you to know I would do the same thing. I'm not asking you to do something that I wouldn't do, nor that I haven't already done. So long before I led an organization called Texas Values and worked at First Liberty Institute and became a lawyer, I was simply a Texan with a dream, a strong Christian, and a desire and passion to serve our Lord and serve our fellow man. So that led me to the University of Texas, worked my way through school. But before that, as I like to say, I grew up in southeast Houston under the shadow of the San Jacinto Monument. You know, a lot of people from other parts of the state, you know, the Alamo gets all the attention, right? It's one of the most, you know, uh, tra traveled tourist destinations. Us, on this side of the state, we're all about the San Jacinto Monument, and we should be. That's where victory was won, right? So that's where I grew up, on the east side of Houston, with a dream, with a passion, a fire in my heart to serve. Led me to the University of Texas, and... Started driving my truck around as a student, and I would hear these radio broadcasts of Jay Sekulow. Who's ever Jay Sekulow? Right? Talking about the impact and the challenges on Christian rights. And I thought, wow. And I remember praying about it. And I said, Lord, 
if I could just work on one case and one issue, it'd be to go to law school. So I went to law school with the goal of training to become a lawyer so I could defend people and be an advocate and stand in court for them. But before I could get across the stage to get my diploma, I found myself challenged with a legal issue of myself, my own at the university. So I was a part of a pro-life group there. Well, the university, some of the brass there, the dean of students, they didn't want our organization to have the same rights as other organizations. So when we tried to have events to educate people about the life issue, they applied different rules to us, wouldn't let us have an event. So what's a law student to do at that point? We sued them. But you know, it's a little bit easier to say now but I will tell you what, there was a young lady that started that issue before I came along. I came along and helped with the group. She was about to graduate, and she said, Jonathan, if you don't see this through, the lawsuit's going to end, our group's going to end, and we won't have this presence on campus. So I joined the group, and we became two. The university had scared everybody off. She graduated. It was just me. And I tell you what, it's not always easy to be on your public school campus even as a law student, and really be public enemy number one. I felt that pressure. They were threatening to kick us out of school. All I'd worked for was on the line. But you know what? I had become strong in my pro-life group, uh, my pro-life beliefs long before that point. And I knew I didn't know if the next day was going to come. I didn't know if I was going to become a lawyer. But I was going to stand for life in that moment. And I did. We saw the lawsuit through. We won that lawsuit and had victory in court. But... But the real victory came when we had an event later. And a young lady came up to our event, a young student, who was pregnant and being pressured to have an abortion by her boyfriend. And we gave her information that she never had before because of the freedom that we were able to win in court. And she told us before she left that day that she was going to protect the baby in the womb, and that was the real victory. So... My message to you today is freedom is always worth fighting for. And I think I've got a, a slideshow. I'm going to click through some things, but these are going to be instructive. I've got a few less slides than uh, Rick does. That's okay. So um, I'm going to talk to you about the Texas Privacy Act that's being considered at the Capitol right now. Legislation that relates to protecting privacy in showers, bathrooms, and locker rooms. Yes, in showers, bathrooms, and locker rooms, we're seeing violations of privacy. Before I get to that, though, I want to tell you about some other things related to freedom and why freedom is worth fighting for. This is a picture of a Christmas poster at a public school in Texas. How many of y'all have heard about this case last year? I know the community of Orange cares about the issue of Christmas through help with my friends like Dana Hodges. We've been a part of helping y'all continue to have Christmas nativity scenes. But there are challenges of Christmas in other parts of the state. This woman was told she could put up a Christmas decoration in the public school in Colleen, a very conservative community, military community, so she did. And her depiction of the Christmas issue was the scene from a Charlie Brown's Christmas. How many of y'all seen the movie? Right? So she has a cutout of Linus. She's got the, remember the little scrawny tree, Right? And she puts a message on there, and the words are actually a quote from Linus, where he says, unto us in the city of David, a Savior is born, and it's Christ the King. The principal said, you got to take everything down that references the word Christ. The rest of the poster can stay up, but Christ's portion has to stay down, be taken off, excuse me. So we tried to work with the school district. We, tried, we got a letter from the attorney general saying they didn't have to take the poster down. After it was, they didn't listen to us. We brought a bunch of people to the, to, the, um, to the school board meeting. They wouldn't listen, even though everybody that came up testified, let her keep the poster up. So what did we do? We sued them. And thank goodness our attorney general, Ken Paxson, came right along our side. And a day before, a day before Christmas break was supposed to start and school was let out, we were in court at 3 o'clock. We got a victory from the judge that the poster would go back up, and Colleen, Texas won that case in December. 
just a tremendous victory. We're still fighting for Christmas. So, here we go. Texas pastor protection law, so you get an idea of some of the work we're doing, the fights. We worked on a law last session to protect pastors, churches, on the issue of a decision regarding marriage. That's where it's come to. Pastors were telling us, Jonathan, we want to get out of the business of doing marriages. There's too much controversy on the issue. We don't want to perform marriages anymore. That's how concerned some pastors were. We're like, look, it's so fundamental to our faith and to our church. Why would you do that? Let us work on some legislation. We did pass one of the first in the country, a law that makes it clear, churches, employees, when it comes to decisions based on marriage, if the government tries to bring something against you, the government loses and the church wins. That's state law. So I talked a little bit about Houston. Y'all know I'm from. I mentioned I'm from Houston. You saw some stuff in the video. We look at this issue that's come before us. How many of y'all have not heard about this? And so while, and just in case you haven't, I've got a handout for you because I told you we're going to school. We're going to work tonight. If I could get a hand, and if I run out of copies, I'll get you more. Um, this is a handout about the bill that's being proposed at the Texas legislature to protect privacy in our government buildings and bathrooms, showers, locker rooms. And I also have one other thing for Mr. Covey. If you want to get informed, you want to be equipped like Rick talked about, you want to take action now that you're inspired. Sign up for our email list. It's going to be sent around. We send it out about once a week. So why is the state and why is the media, why is there so much attention on this issue regarding the privacy issue in government buildings? What really started a couple of years ago, really in San Antonio to some degree, but in Houston, the city of Houston had an ordinance to change the definitions regarding discrimination protection and putting words in there like sexual orientation and gender identity and applying them to things like public accommodations. What does that mean? That means a bathroom, a shower room, a locker room, a place that you might go in a public building. But the city of Houston didn't just limit it to that. They made it clear that if someone wants to use a bathroom of their decision of their own based on how they feel from one day to the next about their gender or their sexuality, that would also apply to private businesses. They were going to force businesses to adopt the same type of practice. And if they didn't, they would be fined. And it could end up being enough fine that it would drive a lot of these businesses out of business. So some of y'all may have heard of it, some of you haven't. You know, there was a big issue, but a lot of people don't realize the background to it. The city of Houston is the only city that's voted on this issue. And when it was up to the city of Houston to vote whether or not we should have a government policy that allows men and boys into girls' bathrooms and other intimate facilities, it wasn't even close, the vote, 61-39. So if you think about public opinion polls, the only polls on these issues that should matter are the ballot box. So the one time this issue's come to the state so far, 61-39 to not allow men and women, excuse me, men in women's bathrooms. Not even close. That's a bigger margin than Governor Abbott beat Wendy Davis in her pink shoes. Okay? Pretty significant. But you would have thought, okay, so the issue must have stopped there, right? I mean, Houston's a fourth largest city in the country. Surely that reverberated to other local governments to not get involved in this type of issue. Not to mention, we were in court for almost a year and a half just to get to the ballot. Um, there's more details on our website about that. But my point is, that should have been enough to say, let's stay out of this issue if you're a local government. No, Dallas, right after that, passed something very similar. Then the Fort Worth School District, surely this issue won't reach the public school. We thought two years ago that would never happen. It did. The issue reached Fort Worth, Dripping Springs. I want to tell you a little bit about the Fort Worth issue um, real quick. There's a lot to talk about this issue. I know there's more detail. We've got a website you'll see at the end of this, a landing page, and I've got resources that I've handed out on this. But let me just give you a little bit of detail of why it matters and you should be concerned 
when local government gets involved in these type of issues and why the state is trying to set statewide policy to keep local governments from continuing to make a mess of this because they have. Fort Worth, case in point. You would have thought an issue if the school district was going to start a policy that allowed boys to go into the girls' bathrooms, shower rooms, and locker rooms, that they would have put it to a vote, right? Let's just let the people decide or to let the school district, the school board members vote. No, that's not what happened. And you have to remember this is Texas, and here's a school district following this letter from President Obama that you saw Rick Green reference. President Obama's letter did not just talk about bathrooms. It mentioned situations where you would have showers, locker rooms, even overnight trips. Don't sometimes students have to go overnight to travel to a competition at a different school district within the state? We see it all the time. So Fort Worth said, here's how they're going to handle the policy. They're not going to tell parents about it. They're going to pass it behind closed doors. Not only did they deal with that issue, but when it came to notifying the parents, they forbid the employees from telling parents if a student was asking to use a bathroom or a shower or locker room that didn't correspond to the sex on their birth certificate. Specifically told them they would be reprimanded if they told the parents about it. So this is how it plays out. Johnny's in the principal's office, and Johnny's parents call, but Johnny just told the principal, I want to be called Jane. All right, we'll start calling you Jane. We'll let you use what bathroom you want. So Johnny's parents call, say, how you doing? Oh, I've got Jane in my office. Excuse me, I've got Johnny in my office. And you have the student there going, wait a minute, I thought I was going to be called Jane. The principal in the, the school district was specifically telling employees that they had to follow what the child wanted and conceal that information from parents. This is the type of environment that exists when these type of policies are passed at the local level. We saw it in Fort Worth. We're now seeing it in Coppell School District, which is Dallas-Fort Worth area, Dripping Springs, southwest of, of Austin, and Pearland has had pressure on them. So what do those parents do in those situations that want their child that's a boy to go into the girl's bathroom? Do they typically say, oh, I'll, yes, I'll accept the private bathroom to go into, which would be reasonable if the child didn't feel comfortable. No, they're threatening to sue these school districts unless they let them go to the bathroom of their choice. So just some context for you of why the state has reached a point where they've had enough and they want policy that's consistent across 1,200 school districts. So... What does the governor say about these issues? Well, when the vote happened in Houston, and I didn't tell him to say this. These were his words. Vote Texas values. It was nice, though. Not Hillary Clinton values. Vote no on the city of Houston, Proposition 1. No men in women's bathrooms. That was a big development in that debate, in that vote in Houston. Are any of these incidents actually happening in Texas that we have to worry about? I told you we were going to work, right, and to school. I got another handout for Mr. Covey. I love to give words of inspiration, but even more than that, I like to put you to work and for you to get results because I know you're capable of it. So, and let me hold on to one of those real quick, Mark. There are two and a half pages of privacy violation incidents in Texas in this handout that you're about to get. Probably hadn't heard about it because the media doesn't want you to know about it. It's been going on. I mean, they go back four or five years, but not that long. Most of them have happened in the past year and a half. Here's one right here. A senior center. What does that mean? That means older people that are a little bit more vulnerable are going into a government facility. A, this is a senior center in Denton, Texas. That's not Austin. It's not real liberal in Denton, maybe in some places. But my point is... The government facility, they asked him about this because one of the seniors complained and said there was a, there was a man in the woman's bathroom. What are y'all going to do about it? And so the reporter asked him about it and what he concluded, in other words, people go into the bathroom of their choice in the city buildings. And the government official said, yeah, we don't question that. They're not questioning people. They're allowing them to go wherever they want and be further in a position to create harm. This is what our government officials at the local level are doing. So you've probably heard people argue, well, this is an economic issue, right? You know, if we 
and I'm sorry, there are children here. I have a seven-year-old daughter. So the position basically is, if we don't allow a man to pee next to my seven-year-old daughter, the economy in Texas is going to crumble. Doom and gloom. Um, I don't think so. Are you aware that Texas is number one for business and has been for 13 straight years? Okay. Now, this same issue came up in North Carolina, and with all due respect to my friends in North Carolina and my good buddy John Rustin, who runs an organization like mine there, this isn't North Carolina. But let's talk about North Carolina for a second. You might have heard some details about them handling this issue, and people said, oh, there are people boycotting, they're losing all this money, and so on. Um, guess who's number two for business? North Carolina. All right. After a year or so of them having a policy like Texas is, is trying to pass, not only are they number two for business, pretty good if you're not number one. Not everybody can be Texas. But tourism is up in every county in North Carolina. There are 1,200 people coming to Texas every day. You might have just seen Lyondale just announced a $2.4 billion facility they're about to build just off the Houston coast. You know, I'm a Houston guy. I keep up with what goes on in the port of Houston. We've been working on this issue for two years. There's not been an impact on our economy. But let's see what the liberal media says, the Austin American statesman. When the Texas Association of Business, a lobby group that's gone very left now, but purports to stand up and tell you what the business people think, they put a report together. Even the Austin American statesman ruled their economic numbers of doom and gloom if we had protected privacy in Texas, they ruled it was mostly false. You want to know why? Part of it because their reason for coming up with those numbers were hypotheticals, that they said things were going to happen that never did. You know what one of those was? Their number that we were losing all this money was based on Houston losing the Super Bowl. Man, that was a great Super Bowl, wasn't it? One of the most memorable Super Bowls in history in Houston, Texas. That's part of what their numbers were based on. And, I and there's a, I've got some fact sheets over at my table of the five reasons. I won't hand this out, all right? I'll keep you light back there. Five reasons why their report was wrong. The fuzzy math doesn't add up. Uh, one of them was someone gave them some information based on a website. I mean, just go check it out. Okay. So the numbers don't add up economically, and they don't add up common sense. I mean, let's be honest, okay? And if there's a state that can prove that it should be dollars, daughters before dollars, it's Texas, right? We're not just a state. We are a state. Okay, you know how we are here. It's like a whole other country. As, as Rick was talking, it ain't bragging. We are the 10th largest economy in the world. We're, we just passed Australia and Russia, okay? Our economic industry is vibrant, and it will mirror us doing things like protecting privacy. People will come here, they'll be safer. I talked about the two pages of incidents. Well, what are, you know, what are normal people, regular people, if you will, saying about this issue? This is a father and daughter from Dripping Springs. I, you heard me touch a little bit about Dripping Springs, Rob and Shiloh. They have testified in fa something like that. You'll get this note, this email. No, nothing. Little girls came home and told their daddy, Daddy, there was a boy in my bathroom today. That's how they found out about it. In Coppell, when this happened, the parents there report that one of the boys was exposing himself to the little girl. And you have to remember when you think about this, we're talking about elementary school students but when the school district adopts a policy, and I know this is a lawyer, but trust me when I say it, it's true. They have to apply that to the entire grade system. It can't just be for one particular elementary school. It's district-wide. Middle school, high school, all the way up. When you see the kids start to get in, involved in athletics. So what is Governor Abbott saying lately, right? There are these rumors, oh, the NFL may not have the Super Bowl or you know, they may not have the draft in, da in Dallas. Um, they may remove the, you know, Final Four from San Antonio, which is not going to happen. 
Governor Abbott says, if the NFL tries to come down to the state of Texas, I might just pass a bill mandating that NFL players have to stand and put their hand on their heart when the national anthem is played. Who rules our state? The NFL and some of these corporate CEOs that don't even live in Texas? Or do we run it? Do we as the people? You want to know what the people think about this issue? Look at who they elected 60 to 40. They elected people like Greg Abbott. You know, people will say, well, you know, they had more people testifying on this issue. Or who is at the committee hearing? Those things matter, and I need your help on that. But for so many of us, it's about you already expressing your support of these issues at the ballot box. Governor Abbott is being very strong on this. And Orange, Texas zone, Dana Hodges, state director of CWA, <laughs> has some very important words to say about this and why she supports privacy protection in our state. If you haven't seen her testimony on this issue, you need to. It's compelling, it's personal, and it matters. And you know, while it took a lot of courage for her to do what she does and what she does every day, we know there are other people that have faced similar situations. We know there are other women that have dealt with this issue and they're afraid to talk about it. When Lois Colcourse filed this bill, Senate Bill 3, she put a hashtag on Twitter. Do I have some Twitter audience here who know what I'm talking about? A little message, break the silence. This issue is uncomfortable to a lot of people. This issue relates to past trauma for some women and children who've had things happen to them in intimate facilities. And they're being pushed into a place of silence. So there's a website you can go to, www.txvalues.org forward slash protect privacy. You can find a lot of information on this issue. There's another resource I have that if you hadn't got a copy of it, our Texas Legislative Guide tells you all about the legislative process, how a bill becomes a law, who your elected officials are. As a matter of fact, I think we saw, I saw one other elected official show up later. Is Representative James White? I think I saw you here. There you go, sir. Thank you for being here. Um, so before I conclude, I know I have a handout about Senate Bill 3. Senate Bill 3 that protects privacy in these intimate facilities does not apply to private business. So why is the business community talking so much about it? They want to convince you that if we don't allow local policies that exist in Austin, Fort Worth, Dallas, if we don't allow those to continue to exist, they're going to lose the ability to recruit people to come to their business. I don't believe that. But it doesn't have any direct impact on them. It doesn't require private business to do anything. But let me tell you who does want to do that. The folks on the left, there's a bill that's been filed by a Democrat. They want a statewide law that tells businesses they have to allow men and boys into girls' bathrooms, shower rooms, locker rooms, intimate facilities. The government in that type of bill wants to tell private business what to do. That is not what Senate Bill 3 does. It empowers private businesses to decide to do what they want to do. While we may disagree with that, look, if Target wants to run their stock into the ground like they have by publicly announcing that they're going to allow whoever wants to go into the changing room, that's up for them to decide. We think the market will decide it's already deciding with all of the trouble they're having financially. But Senate Bill 3 does not impact that. It simply makes it clear that at the local level, they cannot have a policy that allows a bathroom. I mean, are, we, are we in a government building? Just like right outside there. How are you to know from one place in the state to the next what the law is on that issue? How are you to know when your child competes in athletics and they go to a neighboring school district or across the state to compete what to expect? It's usually too late unfortunately. And you've seen how local government has handled it. That's how they've handled it. They've told you after the fact. That's what they did in Fort Worth. That's what they did in Dripping Springs, Capel. The list goes on. Um, so in respect for the time we have, I want to hit a couple more things, and then I'm going to close. 
There's an event this Thursday in the Capitol. How many of y'all, raise your hand if you've been to the Capitol before, Texas Capitol, okay? All right, so I saw some people didn't raise their hand. I didn't want to embarrass you. Just kidding. I know it's a little bit of a drive. But, you know, one of the phrases you hear at the Capitol is government belongs to those who show up. Dana will be there. I will be there. Our other friends, we will be there fighting for your Texas values. If you ever thought about when is a good time to come to the Capitol, this Thursday, August 4th, is one of the best times you can come to the Capitol. I know some people are already talking about organizing a bus from here and so on. Get on the bus. Get in your car. Um, And it always matters, and it counts when you come to the Capitol. Thursday, it's going to be a little bit more important. So you can go to our website and find out about the rally and the events that we're having on that day to focus on this privacy issue. This Thursday, August 4th, a lot of our great friends are coming together. You probably elected some, some great elected officials. I saw Dave Phelan was here earlier. Even the good guys need your support. They need to know you have their back. It should be good enough that you've elected them. Okay? But for goodness sakes, California has banned travel to our state. Maybe we should be a little nervous. Right? And I mean, (laughs) and look, hey, I'm a... I'm a UT guy. I'm thinking about the implications for Big 12 and recruiting. If it's harder for California to come to Texas to try to recruit our football recruits, amen, right? But seriously, this issue has gone national. I mean, there is a lot on the line. So it should be enough that you voted the right people in office, but sometimes things change, and you've got to make your point again. You've got to show the other side that you mean it. You've got to show up at the Capitol with your physical presence. You've got to let the good guys know that you're behind them. So come to the Capitol on August 4th or any day that you can. Our office is two blocks from the Capitol. You want to come on a different day, we will do that. We had a pastor that worked with us on Friday. We went to several offices. Come on another day if you want to, if it doesn't work. We'll help you with the process and the issues. If you can't, for some reason, make it to the Capitol, please do not underestimate the value of a phone call of an email, of a social media engagement, liking something on Facebooking, Facebook, re- retweeting something on Twitter. All of that presence shows the strength of our side, your side. It shows that faith, family, and freedom are still Texas values. They are on the line every day. We still got to fight for them. So I know... Um, I'm beyond the time here. I, I'm going to leave you all with a quote from Ronald Reagan that he gave in Texas in the early 1980s. And he said, if we ever forget that we're one nation under God, we will truly be a nation gone under. Those words and what it stands for inspire me every day. I have a family. I have a history And I care about what happens in Texas. I know that you do as well. And I know that we can continue to stand up and win on Texas values if you'll stand with me. God bless you all. Thank you all very much.